One of the readings this week is Neiser's Chapter 2 from the Cognition and Reality book. In this chapter, Neiser lays out in more detail the dueling theories of perception. As we discussed with the Mitchell reading, the categorization of perception into higher and lower level processing entails and implies this notion that one is not just better, but also depends on the other one. That is, higher level processing occurs after and relies on lower level processing. But this one-way directional arrow implies that higher order processing does not impact lower level processing. This is where Neiser starts the second chapter, questioning, is this really true? Try this out for yourself. Can you look at words and not read them? Can you only pay attention to the shape, size, or color without reading the words themselves? If you contrast this with a written language that you're not familiar with, you can only consider these lower level processes. That is, you don't know what it means. You cannot read it and understand it. The same works for the spoken word. Do you know what English sounds like? And I mean like how it sounds to someone who doesn't speak English. I can't help but make sense of the words that I'm hearing. The meaning is always there. I can't see English words without reading them, and I can't hear English words without understanding them. The next critique that Neiser brings up is the notion of schemata, as well as how sensation occurs over time, and the predominance of vision. Now, schemata are cognitive frames of reference, that is, schemas that are said to shape our perception of the world. Neiser argues that rather than there being a hierarchy, there's an integration, that all perceiving relies on what Neiser calls schemata, and that these same fundamental cognitive structures underlie all of perception, including those that have been called lower and higher. It has been a mistake to presume that lower order ones are devoid of these fundamental characteristics that also undergird our use of higher order ones. Chief among these characteristics is that they occur over time. We are not static despite our research attempts to isolate the variable of interest, nor are we present to static fleeting images in everyday life. Perception is an act, an act that unfolds over time. The other fault that Neiser points out here is the use of vision as the model for all of our senses. We'll consider Erwin Strauss's article, The Upright Posture, later on in the semester, which reflects on the central importance of vision as creatures that stand upright. Our faces are further from the ground, leading smell to be less important, for example. But despite vision being centrally important, maybe even primary, our investigation of the other senses render them less important and it's critical that we reflect on the centrality of vision, but it shouldn't commit the dual mistake of ignoring the other senses or assuming that vision is the model for all the others. At a conference that I attended several years ago, one of the presenters had an interesting activity that he tried, and you can try it for yourself. He explored his room with his eyes closed and lights turned off. He got down on all fours. He was also naked, but I leave that up to your discretion. And he just felt his room. And if you try this for yourself, what do you notice about your ability to navigate? When you can't see your room, do you know where things are? Can you navigate your room on all fours? What are you attuned to that you weren't before? But even if vision is important, given our positionality vis-a-vis -vis the world, Neiser is on to something here, the model of vision serving as the backbone for understanding the other senses does a great disservice to fully understanding them in their own right. Now, the information processing model of vision and its extension to the other senses began with Descartes. This idea proposes that light enters our eyes and the image on the back of our retinas is then seen leading to the notion of a little man inside our heads looking at this image. This is called the homunculus and it's absurd at the outset. 
How this little man then sees the image does nothing to explain how we see in the first place. This notion of a little man inside our heads may not be the literal view taken anymore, but it has been replaced with neurons doing the processing and the responding. Yet this passivity of visible light just passing over our retinas and being picked up by neurons fails to account for the perceptual activity of selective attention, attunement, coherence. In short, meaning, we do not see everything. Now, if you've seen the selective inattention video, I won't give away what it is you're supposed to see in the first, um, in the first video. I'll post this on Brightspace so you can take a look. But as you're counting the number of basket, or I'm sorry, ball passes that are made with the basketball, you may become so focused on the task at hand that you fail to notice something so completely obvious when you know it's there. That is, you'll be wondering, how did you miss it in the first place? That visual information was there at the outset from the very beginning. Why do most people not see it the first time around? This is true of every situation we're in. There is so much sensory information available, we do not perceive it at all. It's influenced by cognition. What we're attuned to, what we perceive, is influenced by cognitive processes. Let's talk about this problem with retinal images. There are severe deficiencies with this notion of images. The retinal image is two-dimensional. Seeing the world is not like flipping through a photo book. I'm never confused by looking at a photo of something and mistaking it for the real thing. How is this possible? If I start with a retinal image, there's not enough information contained there to account for this. The notion that our retinas act like film, recording the light that comes in, has severe limitations in our ability to understand how it is that we see the world. In an effort to counter this, Gibson claims this information must be available in the objects themselves. The deficiency of looking inside is flipped around to say that all the information instead is contained in the light, in the object, in short, out in the world. For Gibson, turning the solution to not one of internal mechanisms at work, but the affordances that are available out in the world, means that the focus now relies on the objects themselves. All the information we can detect and perceive is contained in the world. Now, Gibson's approach is called ecological optics, and it proposes that all the information is contained in the light, the optic array. We've seen how Gibson's solution to the problems identified by information processing is to put the emphasis on the world and to ignore the internal mechanisms that might be at work. In other words, the perceiver is not adding anything to the perceptual activity. They're simply picking up what was already there, available to any perceiving organism. So we have two main theories of perception so far, one as exemplified by the internal processing model that focuses on the perceiver, that is looking at what's going on on the inside. The second, proposed by Gibson, instead focuses on the perceived, the world on the outside. Yet consider how there's nothing to perceive without a perceiver, and there's no perceiver without something to perceive. Neiser is advocating for a joint position. Both of these theories have something to say about perception and cognition. Neither encapsulate or describe the process in full. Let's take a closer look at Neiser's point about time. The French philosopher Henri Bergson distinguishes between two types of time. He says there's objective time and la durée or live time. Have you ever noticed that the time it takes to go someplace always feels longer than the return trip? This is the difference Bergson is highlighting. Objective time is the time that's kept by clocks, stopwatches. It's completely uniform and static, hence extremely reliable. It is imposed upon us, according to Bergson. It is a rather arbitrary way of marking time. It does have its advantages and benefits, but it doesn't necessarily correspond to live time or our sense of time. 
With the arrival of steam engines and trains, a new form of transportation, it suddenly became important to know when and where to be in order to get around. It also formed the typical 9 to 5 workday, separating the work week from the weekend. However, live time is a perceptual cycle. It's not static. It's not a snapshot of one moment in time. And note how the notion of a snapshot, that is, taking a slice out of time, is the very way in which the information processing model proceeds. A retinal image that is processed by the occipital lobe is a static, timeless image that doesn't correspond at all to lived time. Because a single stimulus can be isolated in, say, vision or hearing, that is, an image or a sound wave, there is a discrete neural point of contact, the retina or the basal or membrane. Vision and hearing are relatively easy to figure out compared to the other senses, that is, discerning how they work from an information processing model. But when these are treated as the model for understanding touch, it's rather difficult to do this. Static stimuli that touch the, the skin resolve in unreliable accounts. Passivity doesn't quite capture haptic touch perception. What if the static image on the retina is not the model, but rather the exception? None of the other senses may work like this. As we'll see throughout the course, a moving, living body is necessary for all the senses, and I would argue including vision. Hearing and listening are not individual sound bites that are simply pieced together. Listening occurs over time. Your ability to understand this sentence that I'm saying right now requires that you are continuously listening over the time that it takes to complete it. If we isolate the senses to explore them in an information processing model that is exploring how different neurons detect specific aspects of sensory information from tempo or pitch in the process, we also stop time. Time is crucial for motion, sound, taste, smell, and touch. If you've ever eaten a pepper where the spice catches up towards the end, or the aftertaste of coffee, taste is not a series of discrete flavors, but an experience that unfolds over time. Smells can linger. They can become stronger or weaker. You can get a fresh whiff of something when you first enter a room, but you may become habituated to it over time. You may stop smelling it, or maybe yourself. You can't smell your own body odor, for example. In touch, in particular, we detect temperature and pressure for sure, but consider texture. Is a soft fabric soft if you only press one finger into the material and leave it there motionless? Is sandpaper rough if you only briefly press your finger down in one spot? Movement is crucial, and movement takes time. So far, we've considered the senses in a vacuum. How does vision work from an information processing model? We might explore the notion of that static, motionless, timeless retinal image. It ignores how we also might hear a noise that then directs us to look over towards it, for example. If you've ever tried tasting things with your nose closed or when you're sick, food tastes different. If you've tried reaching in to touch something, but you can't see what you're touching, your mind might race with all manner of possibilities. What is this? Is it gross? Is it cute? By looking at each sense in isolation, our understanding is limited. How do the senses work together and inform each other? Fortunately, the trend that Neiser points out regarding research isolating one sense and studying it may be falling out of favor. There is a growing body of literature that explores the interconnectedness of the senses. These include studies on sensory transference, cross-modal correspondence, even ones that are no even ones that study sonic seasoning. So while the organization of the course is divided into the five cardinal senses and into more complex ones, the body, time, distance, and pain, the choice of articles for this class, call into question the notion of isolation. 
Just as Neisser calls on us to be mindful of the ecological validity of studies, exploring one isolated sense, and considering the limitations inherent in an investigation that only considers one sense, we should also be mindful that the articles that we will be reading study two in isolation, and that likewise ignores how the senses are interconnected in more complex ways. Given that the five senses are often treated separately and independently, I've selected readings this semester that combine two senses or a cognition to illustrate how one sense influences another to illustrate the interconnectedness and synthesis of sensory perception. These influences are called cross-modal correspondence or sensory transference. Pay attention to these connections as this is the focus of the midterm exam.